Hi everybody, I'm Sting and I want to welcome all of you from around the world. I'm very proud to be here to help close out Narrative 4's Summer of Impact. This event has a very special meaning to me, not only because it's named after one of my songs, Synchronicity, but because, like Narrative 4, it's all about art, empathy and action. I've always believed there's a clear link between community and art, between community and economics, between community and storytelling. At the end of the day, we're all in the same boat, and that boat is held together by stories. I helped launch Narrative 4 seven years ago in Chicago. It was hard to know where it would go, how fast it would grow, and how much it would be needed. But I believed then, as I do now, in the power of stories to shape and change the world. Over the years, I've watched Narrative 4 grow. I've seen the students who've led it, I've talked with the educators who are shaping it, and I've shared stories with the artists who are helping to drive the change. Today, we're still about the ongoing sense of change, and it's needed more than ever at this pivotal time. They are anxious times, hopeful times, times of great upheaval, and as Charles Dickens would have said, it's the best of times and the worst of times. But at the core of it all lies our ability to make things better. This is dedicated to all of you and your collective world spirit. And we may not be together, but the message is just as valid and even more urgent while we're apart. Just a castaway, an island lost at sea, oh. Another lonely day, but no one here but me, oh. More loneliness than any man could bear. Rescue me before I fall into despair, oh. I send an SOS to the world, I send Someone gets my, I hope that someone gets my message in my bottle, yeah. A message in my bottle. What that this morning, don't believe what I saw. A hundred billion bottles wash up on. Seems I'm not alone in being alone A hundred billion castaways Looking for a home I'll send an SOS to the world I'll send an SOS to the world I hope that someone gets my I hope that someone gets my I hope that someone gets my message in the bottle A message in the bottle, yeah, yeah A message in the bottle A message in the bottle I'm sending out an S.O.S. Sending out an SOS Sending out an SOS Sending out an SOS Sending
Thanks for being here, and I hope you'll share the Narrative 4 message and support our work all over the world. And now, I'm passing this message in a bottle to a place that I have some kinship with. I come from English coal mining country, and I'm reaching out to 18-year-old Narrative 4 student Katie Stumbo from Floyd County High School in eastern Kentucky, where they also know a thing or two about coal mining. Thank you so much, Sting, for that message of hope that you shared with us all through your song. As you mentioned, I'm from Eastern Kentucky, and growing up in the Appalachian Belt has meant that I've had to endure stereotypes. But through the power of Narrative 4, I've been able to share the stories of Appalachia all across the globe. A few years ago, I partnered with Narrative 4 to create a group of youth ambassadors known as the Narrative 4 Globetrotters. The youth ambassadors come from all across the globe, and we gather once a month to talk about how we want to see community change in our world which has already been started thanks to Narrative 4. Additionally, my school in Floyd County, Kentucky partnered with a school in the South Bronx called University Heights High School. We have been in a two year long field exchange and I'm super excited to introduce my friend, Jonathan George, as the next speaker. Thank you so much, Katie. And hello to everyone from the South Bronx. In my community, we are filled with so much talent, culture, diversity, but just like Katie, we often face these misguided stereotypes. Ever since I began with Narrative 4, my world has only expanded so much, especially because of the field exchange program that's been a part of mine and Katie's school for so long. At the beginning, I'm going to be very honest, I didn't know what to expect. None of us really did. But Narrative 4 showed us that we had to open our minds, not change them. We fell deep into each other's stories, and this is when we realized that even though we feel like we're from two different worlds, we're not so different. And this is where we started to feel like family. Our experience involved connecting with students from Tampico, Mexico, to explore their culture, their stories, their experiences. And now I'm gonna pass this on to my great friend, Carla Monroy. Thanks, Jonathan. Y hola a todos desde México, yo soy Carla. I have been part of Narrative Force since 2014 and that same year I attended my first summit. What can I say of Narrative Force summits? They are not just a great way to meet people from all around the world. It's also a great way to empower those people to return to their countries, communities, schools, and put empathy into action. In my case, I returned to my hometown and started story exchanges in my former high school, where now they have a Narrative Force program that runs from K to 12. As a college student, I continue my work with Narrative 4 with a group in my college where we facilitate a couple of story exchanges. Putting empathy into action is not an easy task, but I believe that reaching out to at least one person makes the difference. To hear more about empathy into action, I'm going to introduce Jamsa, who is doing amazing work in South Africa. Thanks, Carla. Hi, everyone. My name is Yamkela, and I am from South Africa. Um, I live in a small neighborhood called Joslovo, and this neighborhood has made me such a better person because it has helped me through so much and it has installed wisdom onto me and it has made me the person I am today. And so um, we have partnered with Narrative 4 um, and decided to help the people in Joslovo because a lot of people here are unemployed and a lot of people are living under poverty. And so that results to bad things happening in Joslova. So we decided to help out. Um, we started an empathy into action project that is called Trash to Treasure. And it's going to be helping everyone that's suffering and everyone that doesn't have food in Joslova. Um In 2017, I, I, I started, I joined Narrative 4 and it has made me such a better person because I have made so many friends who are so kind and we've become a family, one big family. And so I'm happy to be sending this message to my good friend, my big sis from Nazareth, Israel, Malak Laham. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yamza. I too learned a lot from you in those past few years. Hi, my name is Malak, and I've been a student ambassador for Narrative 4 for the last three years. 
And my favorite memory is conducting a story exchange for kindergartners with the Nazareth Club at my previous school. We were astonished at the feedback from both the kids and their parents. It was important to me because I saw before my eyes that empathy was indeed a universal language that could be learned, understood, and spoken by all ages, if we give it the platform. As Narrative 4 continues to grow, my hope is that whoever encounters it gives themselves the chance to learn this necessary lesson of empathy through story exchange, so that they too can change the way they see the world and act upon this shift of perspective. Recently, I had the opportunity to moderate a session about the universality of storytelling with my new friend, Sinead O'Reilly from Wexford, Ireland. On to you, Sinead. Thank you, Malak. When lockdown started and my world was shrunk to the size of my house, I had no idea it was about to open up again with possibilities when I became involved in Narrative 4. This happened when I read a book which blew my heart wide open. The novel was The Paragon, written by Narrative 4 co-founder Colin McCann. The story touched me so much I felt I had to write to him. I did, and to my amazement he wrote back. One thing followed another, and I was invited into the worldwide Narrative 4 family. Learning how to share stories and connect, albeit virtually, has changed my mindset and filled me with excitement for the future. In the past few months, I have been welcomed as a young leader, trained as a facilitator, and have taken part in Narrative 4's Summer of Impact as a moderator alongside Malak. I've met incredible people over this short time, and I can't wait to meet Malak and all of our fellow Narrative 4 student leaders. It's crazy to think it was only a few months ago that we launched the Summer of Impact with the Paragon. It's my great honour to be able to once again introduce two men who have coloured the world with their creativity and compassion. Dublin's native son, Narrative 4 co-founder and world-renowned author Colin McCann, and Colin McInumra, who lives just up the road from me here in County Wexford. He is one of Ireland's best-loved musicians, a wonderful storyteller, and also a Narrative 4 Global Ambassador. We look forward to listening to his music shortly, but first I'll hand over to Colin McCann. Greetings from New York. Thank you, Sinead, that was incredible. You and all of these wonderful students from around the world are the reason I have every hope that Narrative 4 is going to help change the world. And as Sting said, this is all part of a vast collective effort. All of us are becoming part of a shape with a countably infinite number of sides. And we live in a world, as you guys know, with an infinite number of stories. Narrative 4 was founded on the idea that the essential democracy is that of storytelling. We all have a story and we all have a deep need to listen to others too. And we all know that storytelling, like music itself, is universal to the core. What we're interested in is turning that empathy into action uh, on the ground, in the Nablus, in Tel Aviv, in Kentucky, in the Bronx, in South Africa, and everywhere else along the way. I wrote my novel, A Paragon, which has a lot to do with the idea of synchronicity and bringing us all together to the sound of Colum Mokonumra's music. I can think of no other sound in the world that I'd rather set my words to. And here is a small part of that novel inspired by Colm, and inspired, really, by you guys too. Thank you so much. 91. It often surprised Rami that he could reach so far inside that he could discover new ways of saying the same thing. He was, he knew, making Smadar continually present. It slid something sharp and burning into his ribcage, pried him open even further. Once or twice, at the lectures, he looked across to see the surprise on Bassam's face, as if the new phrase had just cut him open too. 92. 
The force of the blast on Ben Yehuda Street knocked her high into the air. 93. There are times I think she might have been hitching a lift towards heaven. 94. I can still hear the slide of the rollers on that cold metal tray. 95. Physics stole her sore. 96. But Sam kept deep different pieces afloat in his mind, tried them out for size, rearranged them, jumped around, juggled them, shattered their linearity. He liked to put groups at ease. I spent seven years in prison and then I got married. You want to know about occupation? Try six kids in two bedrooms. The groups weren't sure how to take the quips at first. They fidgeted, glanced away, but there was something magnetic about him and slowly he drew them back again. I'm the only man who ever went to England and liked the weather. His accent was thick, he rolled the words around in his mouth, but he spoke softly too and musically. He could quote poetry, Rumi, Darwish, Yeats. It didn't matter if he fractured the story here and there, it was more like a song than story to him. He wanted to get to the rhythm of it. 97. A bony structure at the bottom of the trachea, the shrinx, is integral to the voice box of birds. The pitch of the song is created when the bird shifts the tension on the membrane. The volume is controlled by the force of exhalation. The bird can control two sides of the trachea independently so that some species can produce two distinct notes at once. 102. They were so close that after a while Rami felt that they could finish each other's stories. My name is Bassam Aramin. My name is Rami Elhanan. I am the father of Abir. I am the father of Smadar. I am a seventh generation Jerusalemite. I was born in a cave near Hebron. Word for word, pause for pause, breath for breath. Um, that was a piece called uh, The Minbar of Saladin and it was um, inspired by uh, reading Colm's novel, The Paragon. Um, I was reading it while we were on this extraordinary trip that we took last November to Israel and Palestine with Narrative 4. And uh, so music goes to words, comes back to music and uh, so do circles go. Um, so, music is a potent medicine. It's capable of stopping clocks and of opening hearts. It may indeed be the only known cure for gravity. It can carry stories deep into a listener's heart. We are all a collection of stories. We are extremely careful with them. What a powerful thing then to choose to share our stories with a stranger and to open ourselves to their stories and suddenly there are no strangers and I think this is the magic of Narrative 4. Over to you Colm. Thank you Colm, that was amazing and yes we were all braided in this together in the most extraordinary way, musicians, writers, teachers, students, activists. Uh, it's wonderful because storytelling is um, the heartbeat of who and what and where we happen to be. And next up we have three incredible storytellers. First, Leela Azam Zangane from Iran, from France, from New York, from everywhere really. Uh, followed by Asaf Gavron from Tel Aviv in Israel and Ruth Gilligan who is in Birmingham by way of Dublin, all of us citizens of uh, elsewhere and everywhere. Thank you so much. Thank you, Colm. Both columns, in fact, 
I sort of float in my life between New York and Paris and my memories, imaginary memories of my childhood, Iran. But funnily enough, I find home, real home, yeah, in stories and storytelling. And that's why Narrative 4 has meant so much to me for the past eight years. Was the world fated to bring us together? I think so. But I think the real glue of it comes when we tell stories, even better when we tell one another's stories. Here's a short piece from my book, The Enchanter, about Vladimir Nabokov, happiness and synchronicity. Seeing, ceaselessly seeing, gleaning consciousness, then attempting at every turn to record and recombine its elements. At core, the gift of the Nabokovian novel is this, just this, a call to whom it may concern to capture photon after photon of fleeting life. And in all these years, I have derived such glee from madly recombining that, as VN once told Edmund Wilson of spreading trees with rum for nights of mothing, I'm tempted to say, try bunny, it is the noblest sport in the world. It's as much a matter of remembering and connecting as it is of inventing at times. Thus, from composites, I recomposed. From elements of VN's true story, I imagined other stories, new beginnings, and when some form of meaning, likely half invented, emerged. That was glee, a sense of harmony, of oneness with sun and stone. I will not bore you with the detail of my obsessions. Suffice it to say that now and again, as Humbert salutes his dream blue automobile at the end of Lolita, hi Melmoth, thanks a lot, old fellow, I secretly saluted VN that butterflies inevitably invaded my field of vision, orange, brown, blue insects shimmering in the margins of the most indiscriminate stuff, that the number 23, April 23, VN and Shakespeare's joint birthdays turned up everywhere, bills, dates, hours, minutes, flight numbers, 2304, Paris, Geneva, flunky with blue butterfly sticker, waiting on arrival, digits proffered casually by life's flashing dial, that the invented tree I could not find from my chapter 11, I came across opening Ada at random the very night I finished the chapter. Silly ham cedar is the culprit, I believe. That after I considered naming the last section of this book on 1,000 Shades of Light, I stepped outside and glanced at a shop window and noticed a ragged book titled 1,000 Lights. That when I read about VN's Fra Angelico print mentioned in chapter eight, I realized I had three different versions of that same angel kneeling over my own desk in New York. That just as I switched on my American television for the first time in months, the second word I heard was Nabokov, and this was cable news, that the day or two after reading about a six inch long caterpillar with fox fur segments, which I'd instantly associated with the green and copper shades of Lucette, I detected a hideous little worm, rusty furred with spikes of green floss, slothfully tramping along the inner edge of my bathtub. Slowly, ridiculously, I imagined, yes, imagined, nothing but that. My life stippled with one of those repetitions, one of those thematic voices with which, according to all the rules of harmony, destiny enriches the life of observant men. Okay, so thanks, Lila. Um, that was great. I'm Asaf Gavron. I'm from Israel. I've been with the Narrative 4 from the beginning, 2010, 2011. And I always waited patiently until we can bring it over to my region, to Israel, Palestine, uh, together with my Palestinian partner in Narrative 4, Greg Khalil. And finally, we did it. We had an amazing exchanges between schools here in uh, between Arab Israelis and Jewish Israelis and Palestinians, and hopefully many more. So I'm going to read now <clears throat> from my book, The Hilltop. The bulldozers began crawling slowly toward Musa Ibrahim's olive trees. Another wave of fury reverberated through the crowd of protesters. Dudu, the chubby operator with a wandering eye, positioned the, positioned the D9 blade slightly above the ground in line with the truck of a tree and moved forward. No, came the cries, cries from all around. The eight soldiers and two officers attempted to hold the protest off, but three managed to break through the human barricade and run towards the bulldozer. 
wildly flaying their arms and calling out, no, and stop, and fool. The soldiers gave chase, but the three outpaced them, two men and a woman, she in a long skirt and an orange head scarf, one man in baggy pants and a kafia, and the third in a Lacoste shirt and elegant trousers. The television cameraman darted among the olive trees and over heaps of rocks and dirt. Arab women shrieked. Jewish youths cursed and prayed to their father who art in heaven. And settlers frowned and squinted their eyes and asked, who the hell? The D9N bulldozer is equipped with a heavy cast steel front blade. It weighs more than seven tons, stands two meters tall, and measures almost five meters across. Extending from the edge of the blade are sharp steel teeth, and over them and into the curved blade itself, one after the other, climbed Netta Hirschzon, Musa Ibrahim, and Ronnie Cooper, mm -hmm. who moments later found themselves lifted skyward by Dudu, the heavy duty machinery soldier, who was oblivious of the contents of his new load. <clears throat> Okay, that's it, and over to Ruth Gilligan, my good friend from Ireland, Britain. Go ahead, Ruth. Thank you so much, Asaf. Um, that, was, that was just lovely to hear you read. Um, yeah, it's so nice to be here. Um, I first heard about Narda 4 back in 2014, and I just thought the work they did sounded incredible, but there's such a huge difference between hearing about a story exchange and, and actually seeing one in action or being part of one. And I remember so vividly the first story exchange that I witnessed. It was in 2014 in Belfast between a girls' Protestant school and a girls' Catholic school. And just to see the impact that that day had on those young women was just incredible. And I knew kind of from that point onwards that I really wanted to be part of this organization. So since then I trained as a facilitator, trained as a master practitioner, and um, I've been organizing story exchanges around the UK. Um, I've brought teenagers from the UK over to Ireland to connect with them via a story exchange. So yeah, it's been it's been a wonderful six years. Um, and I'm just you know, excited for what comes next because I just believe in this work so, so much. Um, so now, partly in a soft honour, um, I'm going to read a little bit from my novel, um, Nine Folds Make a Paper Swan, which is all about Ireland's Jewish community. Um, and when I was researching for this novel, um, I spoke to many, many members of the Irish Jewish community and I asked them, you know, about how they or indeed their ancestors had first found themselves in Ireland. Um, and they all told me, this wonderful story about a moment of kind of beautiful synchronicity, um, which is when a boat set sail from Eastern Europe, bound for America, but ended up somewhere slightly different instead. So that is where my novel begins. In time, so many stories would be spooled out of that moment, it would become impossible to count. Some said that when the boat found land, there had been cries of cork, cork, but that in their exhaustion, they had heard New York, New York instead. Didn't notice the difference for weeks. Others claimed they had somehow known the English word for pork and thought that that was what the sailors were heckling. Pork, pork, a barrage of unkosher threats to run them off the ship. Other times, it was just that the captain had told them that this was the last stop, only up the road from America. Only a short, final shimmy in the wilderness. Sure, they would be there in time for tea. But for Ruth and her family, there was only one story, one version of the heartache. So now that my characters have been safely delivered to Ireland, I'm going to pass you in that direction too and hand you over to one of Ireland's greatest living musicians, the one and only Colin McAnumra. Thank you, Ruth. I'm going to play you a piece called The Finish Line. Um, it was written while on tour. Um, I was in Helsinki at the time and very homesick. And it's called uh, The Finish Line. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Colm, for that beautiful piece. I have always enjoyed listening to your music in person, something that's a haunting rarity today. Your music is such a connector and means so much to our students. In fact, it's balm for the soul, and your music really unites the world, especially now when the world seems so polarized and people can feel so isolated as many of our students do. Which is why we need Narrative 4. Narrative 4's Empathy into Action program has transformed the lives of our students. 
and has transformed the culture of our school. Schools that are empathy schools, which is where Narrative 4 helps to you to build into the culture of your school, are schools where students not only achieve academically, but also are able to build empathy and leadership skills. There are less suspensions and students graduate at high rates and they learn not only to listen and to value each other, they also learn the power of their voice and the power of their story and connect to the stories of so many others. We have enjoyed wonderful partnerships in Kentucky with Floyd Central and in Tampico. Please allow me to introduce my wonderful friend to you, Maru Castaneda. Thank you, Hazel, for all that you do to light up the world. I have been involved with Narrative 4 since 2015. I am a Spanish teacher at the American School of Tampico in Mexico. Three years ago, I introduced the K-12 Narrative 4 program at school, in which we have fomented the ability of empathy in the little kids all the way to our high school students. This is done through different activities ending with the story exchange. It is amazing seeing how their behaviors and interaction with others change as we, as we unfold our program. At the same time, we have a group of student ambassadors that help run the activities. By having this program, we are building young leaders with a larger sense of empathy, just like Carla, my former student, that spoke a while ago about Tampico. Not only is it important to have K-12 program, but also to give it continuity in college or university. That is something my friend Don Duncan can tell us more about. Thanks, Maru. As an educator, writer, and performer, I live by the mantra, words have the power to harm or to heal. They are never neutral. I am called to use healing words. In 2015, I started researching with my students how Narrative 4 uses deep listening and personal narratives to enhance and even shift perspective. Then we were invited to participate in the 2016 summit in Ireland. We returned to campus and kicked off a college and community program that stretches across Minnesota and the Dakotas. Since 2016, we have hosted exchanges on immigration, interfaith, identity and difference, land and our relationship to it, and many more. Over 100 students, faculty, staff and community leaders are trained to facilitate these exchanges and Narrative 4 is knitted into the fabric of education at our college. It's found an administrative home in the Office of Diversity and is used in classrooms in the arts and humanities, sciences, and pre-professional programs. That commitment is our recognition that the future leaders we learn alongside must develop social-emotional intelligence, must put empathy into action if we hope to solve the pressing problems of our world together. If not for COVID-19, we would be hosting this year's summit at Concordia College in Fargo-Moorhead, but we look forward to hosting the summit next year. I now live at the border of the USA and Mexico, where I will continue this work, even as I help to train other colleges and community leaders in using Narrative 4. Each time we use the Narrative 4 methodology, we learn and grow. And all of us have learned so much from Lillian De Jesus at University Heights. Hi, Lillian. Thank you so much, Dawn, I miss you. Bienvenido to the Boogie Down Bronx, birthplace of hip hop, home to Edgar Allan Poe. Seven years ago, Lisa and Cullen learned about a program between two very different schools, Fieldston, a private independent school, and University Heights, a public high school. We met at Fieldston, and their intention and my interest in in creating pathways toward peace and understanding were mutual. The story exchange is the bedrock of Narrative 4. And unlike a storyline in a novel, the story exchange is unpredictable. And to foster trust, to protect, to create safe and brave spaces, to capture and cradle those emotions that come to us, we have interwoven social and emotional structures in the curriculum. And that is an ongoing process. Five years ago, University Heights embarked on a field exchange pilot program with, Central, with Floyd Central High School in Eastern Kentucky. The students call each other my brother, my sister. And how did that happen? We made space for each other to listen to their stories with reverence and respect on how we live 
and how we die. We came together to identify a need in each other's community and launched empathy into action programs. And most dear is what happens outside of the classroom. When the work is done, our students continue to be in touch with each other. And here's my sister, Mary Margaret Sloan. We have done so much, Mary. I love you so much, and I look forward to seeing you in Kentucky. Thank you, Lillian, who is the sister of my heart. And I want to welcome everyone to Floyd County here in southeastern Kentucky, where the soil is so good that we can grow tomatoes, white half runners, and silver queen, but where the soul of the community is so rich that we cultivate qualities like hope and empathy, and we understand the power of storytelling which makes this the absolute perfect place for Narrative 4. And in the five years that I've been part of this program, I have been blessed to have the support of my superintendent, who has not only been there for me when I, was just had, when I just had it in the classroom, but who also supported me when I wanted to reach out to KVEC, which is our local educational cooperative, with this idea of having Narrative 4 Appalachia. And even in this time of pandemic, they didn't look at me and say, why would you do that? They said, why not? So now in this upcoming school year, we're gonna reach up to 23 different school districts. And if that's not enough, I am now working with Colin McCann to create learning modules for his transformative novel, A Paragon, so that students can benefit from that, that novel experience, not only here, but elsewhere in the United States and even around the world. But wait, I mean, literally, there's more. A couple of weeks ago, I was in a story exchange with Ishmael Bea, who is a father, a husband, a humanitarian, an author. And he is a man who really lives by the creed of Deacon Art Miller, who said, thou shalt not be a bystander. So here it is to Ishmael Bea. Thank you, Mary, for um, holding my story and um, for your deep listening, for allowing um, something that um, it is incredibly difficult to talk about at times, uh, to be heard deeply. Um, one of the amazing things about um, sharing a story, uh, if the listener is willing, it is that uh, for me in particular, it always deepens my spirit, my humanity my constant learning in this world. Uh, when I take on another person's story, I feel like value has been added to my life um, and that I will go on to understand things differently and to respond to life differently. Uh, and these tools are very necessary and essential in how we move about in the world. Uh, so thank you for all of you who have participated in story exchanges with Narrator 4 over the years and will continue to do so. It is very exciting to see um, what is happening all over the world and how uh, one narrative is folding into the next in so many uh, communities, countries around the world. Um, narrative 4 has been focusing on expansion in variety of locations um, this year, including the African continent, which is very dear to me. Um, and the wonderful uh, news is that uh, um, we've been waiting for this for a long time, particularly on the African continent, where we have a lot of communities in context in which there's a lot of division and misunderstanding and people have not had um, a, a way to sit together to really talk, to understand how much they have in common, but to just hear each other's story. Um, narrative 4 also comes in this space, particularly on the African continent, where we already have a tradition of story. So this methodology just sort of naturally fits into how we would be able to create spaces uh, safe enough to talk to each other and to listen to each other deeply and to make changes. Um, one of uh, the things that I have been interested in um, um, in Narrative 4, Stories Exchange, and the power of it was to really see how it would work on the African continent. So I'm extremely grateful that this is rolling and it's happening and that Bucci, my man, is in charge of it. I'm extremely proud of uh, the movement that Narrative 4 has done. So thank you to all of you who've made it happen. And I'm sure he's going to make some wonderful things out of it. 
Now, in addition to uh, to that, one of the things that Narrative 4 is also doing is not just to tap into people's potential in these places and to have people sit and talk, but to also invest in projects that actually have uh, yield to something um, life-changing for people in their communities. And one of such projects, it's uh, the one that Yom Kela just uh, spoke about, uh, Trash to Treasure project in Joslovo Township in uh, Port Elizabeth, South Africa. Uh, a very poor marginalized neighborhood, but uh, nonetheless the spirits and the intelligence of the people there are not. And so this project is really spearheaded by people who live in the community. They came up with the idea, as Yom Keller mentioned, and so again, ownership of the, 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 the project itself is, is, is always uh, sustainable for one, but also uh, uh, gives um, dignity uh, or leaves the dignity intact of the people who are in these places. So I'm, I'm deeply, deeply honored and thrilled that uh, this is happening. And I'm excited to see what the outcomes is going to be because when you give people an idea of how their lives can progress by also being useful to their community while that is happening, these two things combined together always uh, are something that wonderful can come out of it. So people will clean their neighborhood, but by doing so, they'll be able to have uh, access to certain things that did not have access to food stamps, vouchers, medical care, maybe even school uh, and books for schools and things that uh, they did not know. But most importantly, also an idea and a reason to wake up and think differently every day and feel that there's something you can do to contribute and that by doing so, you will gain something out of it. So I'm, I'm absolutely, absolutely, absolutely thrilled about this. Now, I'm going to read just a little bit um, and then um, I'll continue on with this uh, wonderful thing that we're doing with Narrative Foster Exchange. So this is for my first book, Little Family. I mean, my <laughs> not my first book, my third book. It feels like my first book <laughs> because of how the year has been going, but that's another story. If you were to walk toward a field that lies at the edge of the small town of Foloya, when the sun is awake in the sky, you will hear the breeze whistling through the grasses, parting the dry and green strands as it makes its way to you. Or maybe you will think it is the rustling of someone hiding under the vast shrubs. At the end of the field, your eyes will light upon the face of a boy among the grasses, peering intently at something. You try to see what it is by following the trail of his gaze, but you see nothing. Hello, you say. The boy does not respond, only narrows his eyelids against the wind. You stare back at his face in which youth is steeped in something serious and old, in stories you want to know. You try your luck again. Good morning. You do not know what else to say. Caution trumps curiosity. You sense that you should not move closer. He does not respond. In fact, nothing about his demeanor suggests that he is even aware of your presence. Your eyes search his face one last time, then you give a sigh and continue on your way. Yet as you go, you glance back still hopeful of an answer. And then just as you have given up and turned your full attention to the road ahead, you hear him whistle. Immediately, several answering whistles fill the air. You become confused. Should you move on ahead or go back to the boy? You are more aware of your fear now but at the same time, your belly burns with cautious excitement. You do not know which feeling to pursue. While you hesitate, the shrubs begin a vigorous dance, but when you look again to where the boy was sitting, he is gone, without your having heard him leave. You set aside your fear and try all the pathways that are visible to you, but none goes any distance. Each time, you find yourself returned to where the boy was sitting, the smaller plants stretching to regain themselves in the wake of his human weight. Thank you for listening again. And uh, in order to stretch the wake of that human weight, uh, we're gonna take you to Port Elizabeth, South Africa. And I'm going to introduce you to a remarkable, amazing poet. Um, I can't wait to read uh, her publication, hopefully fairly soon. And a college student and uh, an N4 Global Ambassador uh, from a native of Port Elizabeth, uh, particularly Joe time where I was just talking about, Babalwa Tatiana, who is going to read for you uh, her poem. 
Thank you so much, Ishmael, for your words, for your guidance, for your support. Thank you for being a powerful voice for Africa. And most importantly, thank you for being an advocate for children everywhere. I've been involved in Narrative Force since 2014. And I strongly believe that I'm a walking testimony of the, of the work that Narrative Force strives to do. I have been able to use the skills that Narrative Force equipped me with to bring change in my own community. I've been able to use personal narratives from my own community to break stereotypes, to just to bring change to better people's lives, to help people understand themselves, to, to help people understand, uh, understand each other better. And um, I ha there's still a lot more work to do. There's still way too many lives to change. And I still plan to bring this work to my community and bring more change using Narrative 4, uh, using all the skills that I've um, learned from Narrative 4. So with that being said, I have a poem that I'm going to read titled, I Am From. I'm of a township where love is the neighbors dancing across the street with hands clenching glasses of hard liquor. Happiness is a visiting butterfly that sometimes I wish it would visit more and stay a little longer. So do not ask me questions when you see my eyes bottling tears. I was taught to swallow them. I'm from a place where we learn to cry silently before we learn to hold our spoons. Numbing wounds beyond skin has become the way of life. I'm of a township where it is nothing much. It is nothing much until boiled emotions explode like a raging soda can in fire. It is nothing much her 13 year old spine is bending backwards to support the life developing in her womb. It is nothing much. Young men standing at a door of a shop begging for 50 cents, one rent to help them escape, to help them forget. It is nothing much. It is nothing much is a chorus we all know how to move to. When someone asks about your pain, smile and say, Ayon Dwingako. Thank you. I know, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I know my voice and stories will continue to be part of the narrative for, uh, of the narrative for South Africa. And I am proud to send this message to my fellow students in Port Elizabeth. And um, I'm, I'm more than proud to, I'm more than proud of the path that I'm going and of the place that I can already see South Africa and Port Elizabeth becoming using what I have learned from Narrative 4. What an incredible performance. What an amazing evening. I'm Daryl Bork, a poet from Louisiana and one of the founding members of Narrative 4. Narrative 4 was founded out of the belief in the power of the story. When Lisa Consiglio and Colin McCann invited the writers who founded Narrative 4 with them, it was with the conviction that stories change the world, always have, that stories shape identity, that stories are records of our capacity for violence and records of our aspirations for peace, for home, for hope, for freedom of movement, for freedom to imagine, for freedom itself. A few weeks ago, I was fortunate to lead an event centered around my latest book of poems, Migrari, a book of poems in collaboration with artist Bill Jingles. The poems of Migrari come directly out of my work with Narrative 4 and its major themes, faith, identity, environment, violence, immigration. Today, Narrative 4 is a youth-powered movement. We go directly into schools like University Heights High School in the Bronx and Floyd County Central High School in Eastern Kentucky. We go into schools and communities in Mexico, Ireland, Africa, Israel, Palestine, and other parts of the world. The mission to hear the stories changing lives, which in turn change the lives of the communities that hold them. Stories becoming promises of faith, 
stories becoming covenant. I'd like to read a short poem from McGrary entitled The Yellow Covenant. Rumi met Shams of Tabriz in the square transfiguration. Nothing loud here among the penitents. Books in water are burned, a disquisition on a donkey maybe, then the yellow covenant. That it is darkness just before the light of dawn is just not true. Nothing is as uncertain as an easy saying. Ask any early riser of pilgrimages on his way to the yellow covenant. Flowers you don't see in the white light of noon or in the middle of the night are there. They don't need you as you need them as they need the sun inside the yellow covenant. The mystic forgets the given name or hangs little on it, can carry his names in a coin purse. Loss of names is not loss of everything. The sun names nothing in the yellow covenant. We need person-to-person -person promise. We need person-to-person -person faith. In times of rupture and unrest like these, rupture often bears the names of the fallen. Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, George Floyd, Sandra Bland, Breonna Taylor, and so many more. We need the restorative power of the story, the story as document, the story as guide and pathway to a better way, to the open heart, to the other side. It is with honor that I hand this message over to a fellow Southerner, a citizen of the world, a singer-songwriter who changes us all with her storytelling power. She and her family have been bringing us to the other side for years. Ladies and gentlemen, Roseanne Cash. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, it's an honor uh, to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I was born in the South in Memphis, but I live in New York City, so I do know something about the stereotypes we hold for each other, the cultural divide, the social divide, and how hard it is to reach across the aisles and the miles sometimes. And I also know how healing music can be. And as Sting said earlier, um, how healing it is to tell our stories and how much hope it gives us to tell our own stories. Um, and music is one way I tell my story. Um, music's part of my DNA, so are the instincts for social justice and the thought of supporting these young people through Narrative 4 is, um, is a privilege and to help them, support them in telling their own stu stories and um, healing their own communities. So this is a song that John Leventhal and I wrote together about finding the road that fits your own shoes and walking into a future of love. This is called 50,000 Watts of Common Prayer. One, two.
it's my great pleasure to introduce you to my fellow New Yorker, Janelle Molina. Thank you, Roseanne, for the song, the message, the introduction, and especially the hope and inspiration your family has been giving us for decades. Music is a huge part of my life because it's my constant reminder that I don't have to be alone in my feelings, that I don't have to go through hardships and celebrations all on my own, that I can love me simply for being me. Narrative 4 is also a huge part of my life because in making global connections, I can better craft my story. And I can feel confident when grounded in my identity as a Hispanic female in the Bronx. As a young person growing in a society that can sometimes feel isolated, I often see myself in the lyrics a songwriter puts to music, the words an author puts to a page. Since I've been in Narrative 4, I've been really lucky to meet authors and artists all around the world who unify us in their stories. They understand our pain and they help us come to terms with their ever-changing identities. Ozan Cass does just that. And so does Marlon James. Marlon's work challenges us. He brings us to new spaces, new countries. And he tells us it's okay to be conflicted allows us to be who we truly are. I'm happy to introduce you to a best-selling author, an amazing person, and a great friend to narrative for, Marlon James. Thank you so much, Janelle. Um, thank you for such a fantastic introduction. Um, and thanks to uh, you all for, for tuning in and for watching this is a great night and these great performances. Um, you know, Narrative 4, I remember from the days it was a concept on a cocktail napkin that Colin McCann was telling me about way back in Harlem years ago. And to see what it has become and to see what it means to people. Um, you know, we're, we're pretty late in this. It's, we are, we're late in realizing the power of story and that the one thing we all have in common is that we have a story to tell. And there are people who think um, their lives are too difficult to talk about it. And there are people who think their lives are too easy or simple or privileged to talk about. And the thing about that is both of those are rooted in shame. And both of those pretend that our stories aren't worth telling simply because we have a story to tell. And that's really all you need to tell a story that you just have one. And uh, it, I think, particularly on a night like this about music and literature and how much that has played a role in my storytelling. And I'm gonna read us about a moment where two people tried to bridge a gap with music. Um, the two people are my mother and myself. And it's from a piece called, One Day I Will Write About My Mother. One late morning years ago, we were alone in the house. I still live there, so I was probably 24 or 25. I can't remember why we were alone, but I do remember her knocking on my room door, walking in jittery and anxious. Get up, she said, quick. I did what 20-somethings did and asked, why? I lay on the bed, trying to decide between the Jane's Addiction and Mother Love Bone CDs. Just get up, she said, dance with me. I didn't know what to do. Worse, this looked like a serious request, not a joke. She stood there waiting in the same sundress she always wore, her hair rolled up. I don't dance, I said. She didn't hear me but started singing, and it was only when she got to the chorus that I realized it was Tennessee Waltz by Patti Page. She said it was her favorite song but had never heard it on the radio. She had probably not heard this song in 40 years. My mother was still by the door waiting. I was still on the bed waiting for her to leave. And the awkwardness between us grew thick. As she walked away, I wondered if that was her last shot at being who she was 40 years ago. And my last shot at seeing her when she was younger than me. Thank you. 
And with that, I am going to hand it over to the fantastic New Orleans musician, Sunpai Barnes, who was at the Narrative 4 Summit in New Orleans last year and is joining us virtually this year. So Sunpai, take it away. What a difference a year makes. You know, last year I had the pleasure and honor of being asked by Narrative 4 to join them in their eighth annual Global Summit that brought students, teachers, poets, and musicians here in my hometown in New Orleans. We had a great time, second line dancing in the aisles. It was a magical night. We're all here together again, brought together by music at this most pivotal time on our planet. So many things have changed over the course of a year. Hardships that are unimaginable, some trials, also a lot of tragedy, anger, and frustration. I believe through our common empathy for mankind that we can share a platform that will help us move past all of these things, and be able to have a better worldview of each other. I personally believe that music is one of the best platforms on the planet that people can use to explain their history, who they are, to have understanding of others, and speak in a very honest, clear, and direct way about how they feel. I wanna share with you a song right now that I composed about a story, a case rather, here in the United States. The only case where enslaved Africans sued the United States government and found their own freedom. Something that's so important right now that happened many, many years ago in 1841. And the main character, a gentleman named Madison Robinson, who had the courage and the thought process to be able to initiate this change. The ship that they sailed on was called a Brig Creole, so I have entitled the song, The Brig Creole. <laughs> Slave was 
sold the most. 135 black and brown bodies bound to the four decks floor. The moans and pleas for mercy, white passengers did ignore. With each passing wave, freedom's courage it did mount. The long end for liberty and justice became paramount. They lifted the top deck's great, and he overthrew the first hand. Madison, Washington, Lord, what a man. Along with 17 others, the brig he did secure. The ship is now bound for Nassau, and that I can be sure. The sweet taste of liberty and justice, and it died from victorious court. Some stayed in Nassau, some headed for Jamaica's port. So look out for freedom soldiers, for these are next to kin. Who come as women and children, as well as mighty men. Madison, Washington, the brink we are. The story of liberty and justice for one and all. Madison, Washington, Thanks so much, Bruce. That was wonderful. And I'm just sorry that we can't be together in New Orleans again this year. Hi, my name is Rob Spillman. I'm one of the founders of Narrative 4, and I'm part of the Artist Network. I'm also a master practitioner, and I've had the honor of taking part in story exchanges around the world. And I'm a firm believer in the power of story and the mission of Narrative 4. Today I'm going to read a poem by Mary Oliver called Sometimes, which speaks to me for the mission of Narrative 4. Sometimes. Something came up out of the dark. It wasn't anything I had ever seen before. It wasn't an animal or a flower, unless it was both. Something came up out of the water, a head the size of a cat, but muddy and without ears. I don't know what God is, I don't know what death is, but I believe that between them, some fervent and necessary arrangement. Sometimes melancholy leaves me breathless. Later, I was in a field full of sunflowers. I was feeling the heat of midsummer. I was thinking of the sweet electric drowse of creation when it began to break. In the west, clouds gathered, thunderheads. In an hour, the sky was filled with them. In an hour, the sky was filled with the sweetness of rain and the blast of lightning, followed by the deep bells of thunder. Water from the heavens, electricity from the source, both of them mad to create something. The lightning brighter than any flower, the thunder without a drowsy bone in its body. Instructions for living a life. Pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. Two or three times in my life I discovered love. Each time it seemed to solve everything. Each time it solved a great many things, but not everything. Yet left me as grateful as if it had indeed and thoroughly solved everything. God, rest in my heart and fortify me. Take my hunger for answers. Let the hours play upon my body like the hands of my beloved. Let the cat head appear again, the smallest of your mysteries, some wild cousin of my own blood, probably, some cousin of my own wild blood, probably, in the black dinner bowl of the pond. Death waits for me, I know it, around one corner or another. This doesn't amuse me, neither does it frighten me. After the rain, I went into the field of sunflowers. It was cool, and I was anything but drowsy. I walked slowly and listened to the crazy roots in the drenched earth, laughing and growling. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Hello, everyone. In this planetary pause that has brought us all home to our knees during this global pandemic, it's not been easy. And I've often wondered if this moment of undoing will be our becoming, that finding beauty in a broken world is creating beauty 
in the world we find. We are eroding and evolving at once. This story, it happened, was my erosion of logic. We were in the Arctic, it snowed, the snowstorm turned into a blizzard. For days, we were confined to the tent, peeking out just long enough to see we had zero visibility. And then, one night, after too many to count, it cleared. We walked out of our tent and stood beneath a shimmering aurora borealis and watched dancing streamers of light, green, blue, red, yellow, a sound akin to Tibetan singing bowls emanated from the north. Above, a jagged tooth-like peak silhouetted against the display of northern lights, there was a rotating circle of red flares. My partner and I saw it at the same time, and we wondered what it could be. We ran back to our tents to get our binoculars and looked again. A plane? No. A helicopter? Not at all. A satellite? No. We wondered what it could be. It rose up, moved laterally, as if run by some kind of astro-geomancy, and then vanished. That night, you might say I was abducted. It wasn't as if I was taken by green men into a spaceship. Not at all. But it was like being inhabited by an alien being. It felt as if I was dreaming and being visited inside my body at once. A specific entity spoke to me. It said, you've got it wrong. It isn't oil you should be following. It's too crude. Please believe me when I tell you this is true. This entity said, follow the paths of the caribou in the north and the prairie dogs in the west. It is their migrations and settlements that follow energy lines. But it isn't the kind of energy you think it is. The visitor who inhabited my body began to recite a list of place names from around the world, from Perth, Australia, to three villages in Russia, to a small desert hamlet in Anath, Utah. I was madly taking notes with my left hand in my small notebook that is always by my side when I sleep. Even as my eyes were closed, I was recording the names of these subtle energy lines that were being given to me. And then the encounter was over. When I awoke the next morning, the experience was still alive in me. I walked out of the tent into the snow. The sun was just cresting over the white peaks. The shadow I cast on the frozen ground was not mine. What has been guarded must now be shared. What has been hidden must now be revealed. This happened. I have a map. Stories are a map. Narrative four is mapping those stories. And each time we have a story exchange, it is an exchange of heart and mind. I love narrative four. Won't you join us in this planetary exchange? It is now my great pleasure to introduce the incomparable Sting as he leaves us with his final message. Flesh and steel are one Drying in the color Of the evening sun Tomorrow's rain Will wash the stains away But something in our mind Will always stay Perhaps this final act was meant To clinch our lifetime's argument Let nothing come from violence and nothing ever could For all those born beneath an angry star Let's 
Lest we forget how fragile we are On and on the rain will fall Like tears from a star Like tears from a star On and on the rain will say How fragile we are How fragile we are Tears from a star, like tears from